This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I am not a creative person, or at least I don't feel like a creative person. And I realize for you, the viewer, that might seem like a little bit of a silly thing to say because each one of these videos and builds that I do is at least a little bit creative, but that's the thing about self-image. It rarely comports with how other people see you. I think of myself more as a nuts and bolts type of guy. I grew up with a father and a grandfather who were both working and dare I say successful artists. I spent a lot of my formative years hanging out in art galleries, art studios, and just that whole scene in general. But for whatever reason, I ended up thinking of myself as more of a technical and pragmatic type of person. Maybe that was just my own form of teenage rebellion, but I think a lot of people end up making similar conclusions about themselves. I ended up going to business school and studying economics, and over the years, I just kind of developed this worldview that there were two types of people in the world. There were creatives, and then there were us normal folk. Neither one is better than the other, but us normies just lack a certain creative spark within us that condemns us to a life of cubicles, gray suits, and watermarked business cards. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. But maybe I was wrong. Maybe I do actually have a creative spark and I've just been neglecting it because I was telling myself a false narrative about who I really was. So today we're gonna do a little experiment. Today I am going to follow in the steps of my dad and my grandfather and I'm going to try to make a piece that was inspired by some of the work that my grandfather was doing in the early 2000s. But you know, with my own little twist on it. Ah, that's a lot of dowels. For this build, I was very lucky and had a lot of the materials provided to me by some very generous benefactors. The first of which was my grandfather. He provided me with all of these wood dowels that are left over from some of the art pieces that I showed you earlier in the video. The first thing we have to do in this build is cut these guys into pucks. And in order to do that, I think we need to make a jig. As you can imagine, cutting a round dowel on a miter saw is a little bit tricky, so I wanted to make a V-shaped jig that would hold them and make sure that they all got cut to the same length. Quick little tip here, sometimes it's really handy to mix CA glue and wood glue at the same time. The CA glue sets quickly and holds everything in place while the wood glue cures for a much stronger bond. Next, I cut out a slot that was exactly one and a quarter inches from the end of the jig. This marks the thickness and the length of the individual pucks that I wanted to make. This part of the build was very nuts and boltsy, so I was well within my comfort zone. All right, we have our jig clamped in place on the miter saw here, here, and here. So let me show you how it works because it is deadly simple. First thing you wanna do is put your dowel into the jig, butt it up against the stop, and you are now ready to cut a perfectly sized puck in a couple of seconds. So for the next few hours, that is exactly what I did. I spent my time listening to podcasts and cutting dowels of all different sizes. If anybody is thinking about attempting this at home, I do have a quick word of warning. I experienced kickback multiple times using the setup. However, I did find that letting the blade come to a complete stop before raising it did prevent the issue, so just keep that in mind and be safe. Once I had amassed a rather large pile of wooden pucks, I decided to switch gears. All right, I think that's more than enough little wood pucks to at least get us started. I think this is a great opportunity to introduce another one of the very generous benefactors that's helping me out on this build. This is a mold from Maker Reusable Molds. So what this thing is, well, it's it's kind of in the name. It's a reusable form for epoxy casting. This is made from HDPE, which stands for high density polyethylene, which is a type of plastic that epoxy doesn't stick to. You see, in the past when I've worked with epoxy, I've made my forms out of this stuff, which is melamine. I cut it up into pieces and then use it to build a form. But the problem is at the end of the job, you basically just have to throw this stuff away. And I also want to make this table circular. So the fact that this is already a circle is going to save me a a lot of time. So yeah, big thank you to Maker Reusable Molds for loaning me this for the duration of this build. And if you're thinking about working with epoxy, check them out and tell them Zach sent you. At this point, I think our next major step is figuring out our pattern. And I can't think of a better way to do it than just placing pieces in here and seeing how it looks. So this was by far the most intimidating part of this project. 
It was just me, the normal, uncreative guy, and a blank canvas. But I did have a little bit of inspiration. I wanted this table to look like the Milky Way galaxy. Don't ask me why, I don't have a good reason, but that's what I was shooting for. I didn't really know where to start, so I basically just trialed and errored my way through it, all while trying to create something that looked visually appealing. Well, Shropsack continues to work his way through that pattern and uh, his own issues around creativity, I would like to talk to you guys about my latest creative endeavor and also the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. If you need a simple and streamlined way to get a professional looking website up and running in 2022, Squarespace has you covered. You may have noticed that I am wearing this very stylish t-shirt from fellow YouTuber Eric Spensley. And that is because we have joined forces to start the Off The Cut podcast. And here's the thing about having a podcast. You need to have a website where people can find it and download it. And for that, we turn to Squarespace. Despite being a self-proclaimed nuts and bolts guy, I am not very good at coding. But their website creation tool was so easy to use that I had a functional website up and running in an afternoon. And they even had pre-made templates specifically for podcasts. From there, it was just editing text, moving elements around on the page, and inserting our own assets. They even handled registering the domain for us. So if you're looking to start a website for your business, passion project, or just next creative endeavor, I can highly recommend Squarespace. Check out Squarespace com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch check out squarespace.com slash that builds to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain all right let's get back to the shop and see how I'm doing with this pattern a couple hours later I stood back and you know what I was actually pretty happy with the pattern that I had created though I was feeling pretty drained so I cut the camera and took a break for the night. <laughs> All right, so it's the next day now, and the number one thing I wanna to do today is get all of these little pieces secured together. It's gonna to be a little bit tricky, and it's gonna be a lot time consuming, but I think I have a pretty good method worked out. In the past, when I worked on similar pieces with my grandfather, he would paint on wood glue at the contact point between two different pieces. This worked really well and created a really secure connection, but it also took a long time because you're waiting like 20 minutes for each individual piece to dry. So what I did was use CA glue. I still had to glue each individual piece together, but it dried in seconds as opposed to minutes. I created little tack welds wherever two pieces met. These weren't the strongest joints in the world, but I didn't need them to last forever. They just had to hold until I could cast the whole pattern in epoxy. After that, the epoxy would hold everything together. So I think we're ready to start moving on to prepping for the pour. And I wanna show you a cool feature of this mold because this exterior wall here just pops right out so that you can inject a little bit of silicone to make it watertight, or in this case, epoxy tight. Here's the thing. Most epoxy molds are single piece jobs with tapered walls. The tapered walls make them easier to demold, but the downside is that your final casting will also have tapered walls. This multi-piece design, on the other hand, allows you to have the best of both worlds. You get nice straight edges and a very easy demolding process. In order to keep my wooden galaxy from floating away into the emptiness of space, I clamped it down inside the form. And in order to make sure my spacer pucks didn't get stuck in the epoxy, I wrapped them in red tuck tape. Now that we got all that prep work out of the way, it's time to talk about our third benefactor for this build, one of my favorite companies to work with, Ecopoxy. They provided me with a bunch of their Flowcast epoxy to use in this build. I know I've said this before in previous videos, but this stuff is some of my favorite epoxy to use because it's so user-friendly and easy to use. And also, it's a Canadian company. Check it out, I even got some Canadian buckets to keep our Canadian theme going on this build. Okay, so here goes the whole creativity thing again. I wanted the epoxy part of this table to look like the emptiness of space. So I mixed in just enough black pigment to create a semi-transparent look. And then, at the risk of pushing the boundaries too far, I made a very controversial choice. I decided to add some gold polyester flakes. Now, adding sparkles to a project is always a risky move, but hear me out here. I didn't want my space to look completely empty. So my hope was that the sparkles would look like small stars and other celestial bodies. Whether or not it works out that way remains to be seen. But for now, let's just enjoy this pour. Are you guys ready for this? Because this is the most excited I have been to do an epoxy pour in a while. Here we go, wish me luck.
Look at how cool this is. This is awesome. Oh, I'm very happy with how this is turning out. All right, so one last little note before I get out of here for the day. The middle was raising up a little bit, so I just weighted that down in the middle with a couple of pucks and a paint can. I think that's all we can do for now, so I will come back in 72 hours once this is cured, and we'll keep going. All right, everybody, it is now 72 hours later, or actually maybe it's more like 96. It was a busy weekend, don't judge me. And we are now ready to demold my latest creation. Now, the nice thing about this Maker Reusable Mold is that because it's made of HDPE, I think that's how you say it anyways, it should be really easy to demold. We just have to undo a couple of bolts and then tap it free. Oh, and also I have my little assistant here helping me in the shop today. Say hi to the internet, Phoenix. Step one was removing the clamps and the pockets. See how effective that tuck tape is? Step two was removing four bolts positioned around the perimeter of the mold. Now, in theory, we should be able to just move this ring out of the way. And then this one should kind of tap out. Oh yeah. And then you just pull it off. Oh, this is fantastic. Wow, that was easy. And look at just how smooth this edge is. I am very impressed with this product so far. Okay, now I have to separate the main portion of the table from the mold. Okay, no, that's not gonna work. Yeah, that's working much better. Oh yeah, there we go. Ooh, staticky. Look at this. So one thing that I was worried about was that this epoxy was a little too dark. I worried that I added too much pigment, but this is pretty much perfect. You can just barely see through it, kind of like the emptiness of space. Obviously on this side, there's a lot of sparkles because these sparkles tend to sink down to the bottom. But that's not a problem because the next thing that we have to do is run this thing through the drum sander in order to flatten it out and clean up the surface and get it ready for finish. At this point, I felt pretty good. I was basically out of the creative woods and I was back to operating in my comfortable nuts and bolts space. Now, generally, as a rule of thumb, I tend to overfill my epoxy pores. That way I'm covered in case the epoxy shrinks a little bit. So I had to sand off that excess epoxy using my drum sander, which should have been pretty easy, but this time it wasn't. Hmm, okay, we got ourselves a little bit of an issue here. See, the problem is, that this epoxy is not fully cured. I realized this while I was on the drum sander, but this tabletop is starting to go a little bit concave. I don't know if you can quite see that on camera, but the edges of it are starting to rise. So I'm gonna have to give it a little bit more time to cure. But before I do that, I am going to clamp it to the top of my table saw because the top of my table saw is perfectly flat. So hopefully we can correct that concave. Twenty four hours later and this thing is looking a lot flatter. Oh, yeah, that's way better. And I can already feel it. it actually just feels more dense right now. All right, back to the drum sander. At this point, I think everybody is sick of drum sander footage. So let's just say I did a couple more quick passes to even things out and then I was ready to move on. The next thing that I did was add a slight chamfer to the underside of the table. And when you look at that, I finally got myself a dust collection boot for my router. I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty awkward trying to keep the router perfectly vertical with that hose dragging behind it, but not having to clean up a whole tundra's worth of epoxy shavings made the whole thing worth it. After that, it was unfortunately time to do a little bit more sanding. And by a little bit, I mean a lot of it. I started with 80 grit sandpaper and slowly but surely worked my way up to 320. Before graduating to each new grit, I would take a quick second and wipe down the entire tabletop with a damp rag to remove any excess dust. This extra little step really helps to prevent pigtails and squirrel marks. And also, you get a sneak peek as to what the finished tabletop is going to look like, which is really great for motivation when you're on hour three of sanding. As a final step, I threw an extra fine buffing pad onto the sander and gave the whole thing a good thorough buffing. I gotta say, this is looking really, really nice now. So now I think the next thing that we need to do against my better judgment is spray on to finish. And I say against my better judgment because I'm still not that great at spraying, but it's something I wanna learn, so that's what we're gonna do. They say that practice makes perfect, so lately I've been trying to log a lot more hours on my HVLP sprayer. 
While I do feel like I got decent results on this table, I am starting to question whether or not a poly product was the right choice here. So be on the lookout for a future video where I strip this table down and refinish it with a hard wax, because that's also something that I've been really wanting to learn how to do. All right, so check this out. Last night, I left this guy to dry, and overnight, I received this, which is the last piece of the puzzle of this project. Inside this box, we have the legs for this table, and they're from another Canadian small business called Mayo, or is it Mio? Oh no, I've completely forgotten how to say it. I only know how to read it on the screen because I've just been corresponding by email. It's M-Y-O. And either way, let me show you these legs because they're really cool and really well thought out. So first things first, the coolest feature about these legs, I mean, other than the fact that they are completely handmade here in Canada, is the fact that they're made out of aluminum. So they're really lightweight and you don't have to worry about corrosion nearly as much as you would with a steel leg. So you could even use these in an outdoor setting. The other really cool thing about these legs is that they were custom designed specifically for this table. Yeah, that's right. The owner, Max, really went above and beyond for me on this one. He took one of his existing designs for a full-size set of table legs and miniaturized them down for use in my coffee table. I know that custom metalworking isn't for everybody, so if you're looking for a set of table legs for your next build, I can highly suggest Mio. They've got really nice, clean, contemporary designs, the build quality is top-notch, and the team is super nice too. With the legs assembled, it was time to mount them to the table. I used a center hole punch to mark the location of each bolt hole, drilled some holes, and then installed some threaded inserts into them. And yes, I am using a washer to screw those inserts in. Pro tip, get the threaded inserts with the hex heads, not the slotted heads the way I did. At that point, there was nothing left to do except to flip the table over and see how it looked with its brand new set of legs. Oh, ho, 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 look at this. Let's just flip this guy over. It does weigh quite a bit. Oh, yeah. That looks so good. Okay, now for the real question. How does it look in the living room at home? Let's go find out. there's one thing that I want people to take away from this video, it's not how to build a table exactly like this one. So if you want to do that, please, by all means, go ahead. I absolutely love when people send me pictures and videos of work that they've done that's inspired by stuff that I've done. It makes my day. But the real takeaway that I want you to take away from this video is that you might be telling yourself a story about who you are that isn't accurate. I know I was, and likely still am to a certain degree. You are probably a lot more creative than you're giving yourself credit for. And being creative is a skill that you can develop through practice. It's not something you're either born with or not. So I encourage you to get out there and build something or draw something or write something, whatever it is that interests you. Just get out there and start building that muscle and be prepared to suck at it for a little while. That's fine. We all suck at things like me when it comes to ending this video. Thank you so much for tuning in and spending the last 20 or so minutes with you. Big thank you to all my very generous benefactors who provided me with products to use in this video. I will include links to all of them in the video description so you guys can thank them out. As always, big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters who you can see listed here. And finally, I would really appreciate it if you could like, comment, and subscribe if you aren't already. Believe it or not, it really helps my channel to grow and it gives me a lot of motivation to keep creating new content. All right, everybody, that's it for me and I will see you in the next video. Peace. Oh, and I almost forgot, I have to do the good old fashioned stand test because people always ask me how strong epoxy is. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty tough. All right. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.